uh, this uh, information here, of the pressure control model, and then some inference or decision model could be decision support, could be ready to uh, some data analytics mechanism to generate new knowledge from uh, pre existing data, with machine learning, etc. Uh, so, how do we do that? How do we preserve the meaning and context of data across organizations? Well, uh, if we look at the problem from a research perspective, I was having a conversation with Cathy here, this uh, expert in semantic web technologies. Uh, basically, the accepted way of doing so would be with uh, some clinical information standards, open uh, fire, less deviations, some sections of the criteria, and then enrich this with some uh, medical ontologies, with this novelty or the human phenotype ontology, we want to enable reuse and phenotyping in the race, etc. So, when it comes to opener, how do we do that in the projects I work for? Uh, basically, we use archetypes, mostly. So that's the, the basics of our work, and that's our uh, cornerstone for, for, for uh, modeling a data reuse API. So in Norway, uh, Opener was selected as a standard for presenting clinical information in e terms by three out of four regions. So when it comes to secondary healthcare, Opener plays a very important role. And since 2013, the National Editorial Group of Archetypes, uh, of which my Colleague Rune, who is sitting on the back, is uh, a member, or was a member, um, has been eliciting a uh, new archetype. So, originally they downloaded some from the International CKM and then they've been undergoing reviews and creating new archetypes. Uh, also, City of has been the one uh, doing a lot of the work in Norway managing these archetypes and communicating with the International CKM. So, with the archetypes are ready, uh, in different, well, and they've undergone different uh, reviews uh, by representants on different uh, regions. They usually communicate with the international CKM and provide some feedback to it. So, national results are collated and presented to the international CKM. So, we published models in the international CKM has half a lot of uh, robustness, let's say, because they've been undergoing reviews nationally and internationally. And for data reuse, we do a similar thing. So this is the Clinical Knowledge Manager from HIMED. Uh, so the, the work we did started in spring 2018. Uh, so the project kicked off on 1st of January 2018. And the modeling team has been undergoing a very intensive task uh, with the help of uh, Ian McNichol and some, also some external help. So they've been mostly at the beginning translating archetypes, but now they are also generating archetypes that are specific to the use cases that I, I will show you later for uh, cardiology, infection control, and, and um, oncology. So as I said, we've got uh, several uh, CKMs around the world. Some of these are not really CKMs, but it's teams of people that provide feedback to the international CKM, and this provides a very robust results. So as such, I will show you later for us, it's very useful to, okay, when we are modeling some API, for example, in a project in Norway, where we want to standardize some uh, EHR uh, from the GPs, for example, to go here and to the, our national CKM, check what is available, try to uh, make a model, uh, have a plate, and then communicate with our national uh, CKM, in, in our case, CDM packet, to validate that the models make sense and those are the archives we, we should use. So it becomes uh, half, I'll reduce this part, the representation of semantics in clinical data warehousing. This part is much uh, less clear. It would, be, uh, it would involve the use of uh, uh, biomedical ontologies. Um, for example, in Norway, we've got uh, Sonoma City, a part of Sonoma International now, but it's very unclear how to implement that. When I say how to implement it, it's not for a particular use case in one hospital. Uh, I'm talking about national scale to generate value sets, validate those value sets, enable the governance of uh, the value sets, and then think maybe in whether using or not some more complex logic models when it comes to data reuse for enabling expressive queries and, and, and so on. So this is a concept we presented in, in this study for clinical decision support where we believe that the looking at what has happening in the semantic uh, web community, we think uh, the semantics will go to a less heavy semantics. So instead of using full description logics, more RDF-based models. And for example, uh, in the words of uh, LG Niels who is uh, one of the uh, professors in the semantic web in France, uh, we would probably define very small uh, places called uh, like knowledge traces, where we connect some ontologies and then index the uh, archives if we need more expressivity. But as I said, this is more a research topic and uh, reality. 
Uh, so jumping now to the most uh, interesting part, I think, of the presentation, which are real experiences, real use cases uh, that we've been uh, implementing. The first one is the national uh, project practice set, which is based on this project, the LHS toolbox in Norway. And the second one I will present is uh, Highridge, which is a project from uh, Germany. Also. Uh, the LHS toolbox is a project that was founded funded in 2015 with uh, 12 million, which is around 1.3 million euros. Uh, it's based on the evolution of on a system we have for distributed computations uh, called the SNOW uh, that allows to perform uh, aggregations of data and, and so on in a distributed manner without exposing the patient data outside the organization where it was captured for privacy and security reasons. And now it has evolved into the National Primary Care Research Network, which is uh, Praxis. We are undergoing a huge uh, recruitment process at the moment, so we have some laboratories which are part of the project already, and we are pumping data and, and transforming data and so on. But uh, many others are still being recruited in, in practice. So the way it works is uh, based on uh, this studies here uh, from my colleagues, uh, Lesbele and Kasadi. So basically, we've got the SNOW system, which allows you to run distributed computations. So basically, you can design an algorithm and run it in a distributed manner, then gather aggregated results from it. <coughs> and on top of it, we put embed, which aims to use parts of the system to uh, do uh, distributed statistics. So we are able to run some descriptive statistics across different uh, sources. So we don't need to extract the data, put it in a CSV file, and then take it to R and do a logistic operation model or whatever. We can do it in a distributed manner. Um, so what we do is we place, uh, this is actually a box of the computers we place in each NGP office. It's a box like this size and we plug it in the EHR and this way the data extraction process goes from the EHR into this small box but it does not physically live outside the, the, the institution, the GP office. Um, where does Opener come in all this? Where it comes when we need to provide a common API access for these uh, computations if we want to query them, etc. So what we have is the GP offices, EHRs, and then we start data with this node that this is a proprietary format. And ideally we would like to have a common view, like a virtual, we call it a virtual data set, which is actually distributed but we can use for research and running uh, data-driven algorithms. Uh, so what we do is we undergo a transformation stage, which is uh, described here, and then we populate a uh, DIPS uh, uh, opener repository. So this happens in GP offices and also in uh, our office. And this is more or less like that. So the idea is to work for clinical decision support and mostly uh, health quality measurements as if we were working against uh, an opener repository is actually distributed. So in, we are currently working on the transformation stage, but we are not able to perform these computations in, in, in AQL or using open. At the moment we do them with the with CQL and the original uh, SNOW system. Uh, so I'm jumping now to HIMED, which is a bit different project. So it's, uh, it's different in the sense that there are much less uh, data sources. But those data sources are much more complicated because they are uh, German hospitals. So HiMed is a project that was uh, funded with 30 million euro originally, and then it got 10, 10 plus uh, million euro because some satellite institutions are joining into into the project, and then we received some funding for, for this. Oops, yeah. So data is produced inside the healthcare system and should provide valuable insights and should lay the foundation to establish the learning healthcare system, as I said. Uh, so the aim is really to establish a national infrastructure to enable uh, secondary use of, of data across different German hospitals. There are different partners, some of them are more uh, academic, so the core is the uh, uh, medicine of truth and alpha. And then we've got uh, the German Cancer Research Institute and Heidelberg and Göttingen also. Then we've got other uh, research institutions at universities. Um, 
those have some commercial partners, like this, and these units, etc. We have to implement. And some organizations have, such as uh, Opener, HS7, etc. So, um, and then there is a highlight in Compasses, the fourth of the German University Hospitals. Uh, there was an application phase for the project between 2015 and 2017. And as I said, it started in uh, January. Uh, 1st of January 2018, and it's basically a competition with uh, three other consortiums. So the German uh, ministry funded four projects, more or less with the same funding, and we need to compete against other consortiums. So at the, begin at the end of the fourth uh, year, they, we will undergo an evaluation, and the government will decide what is the more or less the, uh, so the, if, if some of the consortia remain, none of them, uh, they will choose which approach they might. Uh, the same principle uh, is that uh, to join forces to build an open, scalable, and fire platform architecture to combine data from care, research, and external sources, and to build interoperable uh, applications. So, the principle is similar to what I showed you in, in LHS, in Praxis Ed. So, it's to build a uh, data integration center in each of the hospitals and satellite hospitals that have uh, been coming, uh, persist data into Opener and then expose uh, fire, some fire uh, interfaces for those German institutions that require fire. Um, so this is again some of the participants in fire. Uh, some of the basic principles, so the patients should be able to provide uh, access control, and that is uh, done by the IHE, uh, Advanced uh, Patient Privacy Patient Fire or something like that. So I don't uh, data safety and privacy, so it should be enabled. Uh, clinical uh, data modeling using archetypes and scalability. So technical solutions uh, must be optimized to handle high volumes of complex, constantly changing information and clinical work. And that is the main reason for choosing healthcare actually. Uh, we think it's probably the most robust models that exist out there and that have been tested and, and reviewed by many clinicians. Uh, so this is the architecture of the product. So we've got these columns. Each of them represents a data integration center. So I work for the Hanover Medical School. Uh, this represents Göttingen, uh, Heidelberg, uh, the German uh, Cancer Research Institute, and then there are some satellite institutions. So from bottom up, what we see is we've got the daily chart, we've got the radiology systems, laboratory systems, etc., that need to undergo an ETL process to populate popular based uh, uh, data warehouses. And then we build all the fresh endpoints, uh, providing architecture language, fire, and XDR uh, outside to perform computations, etc. So at the moment, we, of course, we are not doing uh, all this. We are at the stage of defining archetypes. So I think that next year we, should, we would like to start pumping data, but we still have not populated this. So we are working on the ETL process here, and uh, modeling the archetypes for this. This bridge is done. Uh, uh, but as you see, uh, Opener is like a central point for this. We've got three use cases. The first one is on Rolling, which uh, addresses challenges in mental informatics when integrating analytics data. So, new archetypes have been generated for that. But Ian knows more about this than I do, actually. Uh, the second use case is Cardiology. Uh, which aims for the integration of data from wearable and connected devices to the uh, IT architecture. And infection control basically aims for the, for the algorithm detection of pathogen clusters. So this means for the resistant bacteria that travel across uh, uh, hospitals. Okay, so I'm going to speak about the organization <coughs> challenges mostly in, in these projects. They both are challenging, and these challenges come, of course, from the technical side. So there's a lot of heterogeneous data sources, uh, both in structural meaning, uh, common representation formats are needed, like Delta etc. Semantic interpretability is required. Uh, we need to also enable expressive queries. So that's where Stomacity should play a role. And we also face organizational challenges, which are, which are sometimes the toughest one. <coughs> so we need more flexibility uh, managing project funds. It's extremely complicated. We face an excess of regulation in, in both projects, uh, in public funded projects. So we have many problems when it comes to hiring people, for example. 
uh, we consume a lot of resources in administrative tasks. Uh, Procurements are usually slow, but that's the way it is in the public sector. Uh, do one's part. Uh, but the problem is that this harms some small, medium-sized companies because they don't have the resources maybe to wait for one year and do a heavy, uh, heavily demanding uh, procurement. Collaboration among different health regions sometimes is very complex. And for us, recruiting high skilled IT professionals is complicated. So the salaries usually in the public sector are much higher. So it's complicated to find, for example, software architects, experienced software architects. That's very complicated. So we alleviate uh, this by partnering with uh, some vendors that have interest in developing new products uh, together with, with us. And I will show you now. Uh, later on uh, the photo this. Um, so another challenge is GDPR. Uh, this is mostly in Norway because we face, so we want deep privacy because we don't take data out. We are able to perform aggregations and some descriptive statistics across uh, sources. But if you read GDPR, it basically says, okay, for running a research study, even if data is anonymized, you need a explicit consent from patients. But if it is a quality indicator, then you don't need it. Mm -hmm. What's the difference, really, between a yeah. research study yeah. and a quality measurement study? It, it, it's a blurry line, and we don't know really how to do things well. We want to follow the law, so but when you ask regulators, it's still uh, unclear, let's say. Mm -hmm. uh, we need more efficient mechanisms to enable uh, patient control. So we need ways to reach the patients so they can provide their consent, etc., to run research studies. Um, as I said, this, uh, this border between research and study and, and health indicators. And so, I'll finish here the part about the Norwegian and the German project, and I'm jumping now into the result of the, uh, this partnership between Hybrid and, and Aventure, which is uh, Airbase. It's an open source open repository we've been working on for the last uh, nine months. So, it's it was formed in a hybrid project, but it's fair to say that it comes from a branch uh, from the uh, Aesthetics, created by the Ripple and uh, founded by the Ripple Foundation. It's an open source repository, uh, Apache 2 license, so it's pretty open what you can do with it to explore uh, uh, open repositories, create new projects, etc. And we expect to have the release one for Zero coming next week. The day, I don't know. <laughs> because we are working with the uh, DevOps people, and they need to uh, provide us. Uh, the appropriate framework to, to manage this. So that is the website. So if you go there, you will, you won't be able to access this with the next week it will be open. Now there's a password you need to set up. It's basically the website uh, about their base. There will, uh, there's a uh, Git repository so you can download the code, explore it, how it works, how persistence in Opener works. Maybe you don't want to know about it. <laughs> you will have time have some uh, nine months. We are free to go there. Yeah. Uh, it's based in open standards, opener, uh, an open platform, uh, operational support may be provided by uh, our uh, commercial partner and advisor group. And yeah, that's it. So I want to acknowledge uh, the teams I work for. Uh, this is from the LHS in Norway. This one is there. Uh, uh, thank you very much. And if you have questions. <laughs> It was very condensed, sort of stuck there. Okay, uh, yeah, my question is it's more about uh, the, the German project or more about the, the having three or four, three or four different projects? Three, four, three, four, four different projects. So they are using different technologies, different standards, different everything, or, or, or are, are like overlapping? No, no. It's, uh, so each project has some. Well, basically, there was a proposal between 2015 and 2017, mm -hmm. uh, where they proposed their idea about the infrastructure to enable the trees and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, ours was based in uh, Opener, mm -hmm. and the other consortia are based in other stuff. <coughs> Commit more to HL7 or to other uh, approaches. Okay. And there's no, to my knowledge, but uh, Birgit is the one to answer this question, who is the main architect. Mm. Uh, there's no much 
uh, interconnection between the consortium actually we are competing. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, actually, uh, you, you don't have any kind of uh, mid-term analysis or something like that. It's, it's just on the end of the term, you would know if it's okay or not to keep going. Okay. Yeah. Any more questions? Um, what was the reason that you forked the open source project and didn't choose to put the development back in the already existing? Uh, so, Originally, EtherTest was managed by the Ripple Foundation, and I think it was mostly, I don't know the details, but uh, a decision made to have a separate board for the management of the open source, uh, this German branch, let's say. But they have like the uh, same basis. Uh, ideally, we may see in the future that they still, again, come together. At the moment, that's about it. I think it'll, it'll end up being the same thing yeah. eventually, but the existing one has some customers in the UK, I think, who it's installed, and the, the, the new one, the um, Vita group, which is a company, uh, so it has commercial interest that it's going to use, I mean, it's using open source as part of its marketing strategy. They wanted to have the code base closed while they re-engineered bits probably for some sensitivity to competitors. Now, if you think if I was running a company, if any of you were running a company, you probably think, well, if I'm going to go open source, it's a, it's a risk, you know, it's not it's not a light decision. And if you're going to sink a lot of uh, resources into doing that, you have to sort of be careful about the way you do it. So I, for me, it seems like a natural thing that a company would do. And I think they're pretty brave to make the whole thing open source again. And it's just life, it's, it's a fork. And okay, maybe that's not ideal, but um, they did a lot of re-engineering using Spring, Java Spring, um, a framework and so on. So, anyway, the, the good thing is there's a new open source, I think, very, I mean, Lewis knows better than me, but very high quality uh, code base there. Um, and that's going to be, you know, good for the open air community. And I think it's um, uh, over the next couple of years, the fact of two, those two forks, I think, will kind of resolve itself in a natural way. Maybe it's not the totally most efficient pathway, but you know, that's life. Nothing's, nothing's perfect, is it? Yeah, and of course the beauty is because they're both CDRs, they have the same common API, they work in AQL, so you can, somebody who's an existing Ethersys customer can swap over very easily. Or if it doesn't work out, you can swap back. I was just going to say, just, just uh, maybe something to reflect on your experience. I think something that often isn't un well understood by people who are commissioning services uh, and trying to manage, you know, we, we all want that flow of data to come from the you know, operational side somehow through into registries and analytics. But there's often quite a big step change in the way the data is, is managed. And um, Diego, you know, that was the, that was the issue that Diego had. We also had it inside. The, the, it, it's part of the, it's part of the story. I just wondered if you want to comment on that. Yeah. So, yeah. Actually, maybe I can go back and show you. Mostly for all the rest of the audience. So I can check maybe. Uh, so I want to show this figure here. Yeah, that's the one. So basically, I was showing this uh, figure. Uh, this is from the one from Pilot. What you are talking about here is uh, the CTL stage. Well, but that's extremely complicated. Actually, mm. um, there's a lot of uncertainty in, 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 in this stage because, for example, if you go for laboratory data in both in Norway and Germany, that's coded with a specific. Uh, Coding systems that belong to each hospital. So, okay, they, they, they can be mapped to OE with some issues, okay, but this is doable. It's fully structured data, and that's doable. But when it comes to clinical narratives, well, that's another world. <laughs> because you, uh, yeah, that'll be fine, but if you don't check manually that what you are actually structuring is correct, you might find very strange things. Um, at the top of here sits an algorithm that knows nothing about this. 
-hmm. and then you will create wrong inferences. Mm -hmm. So this is certainly going to be a challenge. So in, in my opinion, to do this properly, maybe we will need to involve manual uh, validation or creation, um, do some NLP um, for as a helper, but then validate mm -hmm. manually mm -hmm. each single mm -hmm. structure that comes from here. It's, and, and that's a terrible work to do. But I don't think this can be automated. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, uh, oh, that's absolutely. I was also meaning that I mean, there's, there's often a kind of um, transition from operational stuff, which I think in, in linguistic terms, I guess it's open questioning. You know, like what what problems does the patient have? So in a, in a typical system, GP system, hospital, you've got a list of patient problems or diagnosis. Whereas when you come into the registry or analytics world, you get the sort of questionnaires that, that Diego was talking about. Does the patient have diabetes? Does the patient have angina? So you're flipping. You know data type terms, you're flipping from a coded text to a Boolean. That's a very simple example, but there's a lot of that happens because, if you like, that sort of data capture world has come from a different direction. Uh, and we, we, there's, there's quite a lot of work to be done in terms of people understanding that that transition is not going to be really simple. It's going to take a while to work. Yeah, yeah. So the problem, when you, well, at, at the top of this, you would have, for example, some structure that is not a standard but integrates like all the data that you have here. But in order to get to this integrated view, just before transforming it to open it, like a linker task, for example, it takes a lot of work, a lot of ETL uh, processing. And you need a lot of experts here that understand very well the meaning of each field in the database and so on. So, yeah. so it's a very complicated uh, process. Any more questions? Okay, so then we can jump to the next presenter.